Welcome to the fourth module of the third week. In the preceding module, we have covered a major discussion of meta narratives and we had also especially discussed Lyotard's work published in 1979 titled The Postmodern Condition A Report on Knowledge. We have discussed the fourth parts and the fifth part we shall start the discussion now. We find that Lyotard has talked about the combining forces of technology and economy. This combined force of technology and economy is a major argument of the postmodern philosophers as we have already discussed earlier. Now, united with the economic forces, the technology also starts influencing the way the state functions, the way the administration of the state functions and the way the policies are also implemented. Lyotard starts by saying that machines have started to control more and more things, many functions related with regulation, many functions related with reproduction also therefore, are being controlled more and more by the machines. The onset of artificial intelligence has only complicated the issues. So, in this scenario, in the postmodern world, the question we face is not exactly what the machines are doing, but who will have the access of towards and the control over information which has been gathered by machines. Lyotard also starts saying that normally it is the ruling class who have access to the information which is gathered by machines or computers. So, therefore, they would have easy access to the data, they would also be in a position of decision makers and therefore, the ruling classes would be in an advantageous position as far as the information technology related state functioning is concerned. At the same time, Lyotard also cautions us that the traditional setup of a state is also changing. Gradually, it is taking the shape of conglomeration in the shape of corporate leaders, heads of different organizations including labor organizations, religious organizations and administrators also. So, we find that in this world now, the priorities are shifting. Earlier, what used to attract people, the professions, the institutions, the historical traditions, they are now not attracting the people that much. And it also looks as if they are not going to be replaced at least in the former situation. It results into a particular type of crisis in our world. For example, who are the great names in our contemporary history, who are our heroes. So, you would find that these situations become difficult and also pose a different issues which were not faced by the modernist cultural climate also. At this point in his work, Lyotard has also referred to a contemporary phenomena that is what exactly I was referring to when in the previous module. I had referred to this fact that some of his illustrations are rooted in a particular point in history, though they do not take away the validity of his arguments. So, he has taken the example of a French philosopher to illustrate this idea that every individual has different priorities and different reference points also. So, extreme individuality is also something which we have to recognize because ultimately each individual is referring to oneself. Now, this individuality ultimately can also prove to be slightly dangerous and can port us back to Nietzschean argument, because each of us knows that our self on its own does not amount to much. This argument is carried further by Lyotard as to suggest that the breaking up of the grain narratives leads us to what some authors had analyzed earlier in terms of the dissolution of the social bond, which may also result into the disaggregation of social aggregates in a mass individuals. And here, Lyotard has also given the reference to a scientific term and the term he has used is the Brownian motion. Now, this Brownian motion is ultimately a representative of an extreme flux in a scientific experiment. However, Lyotard has used this word, this term in a non-scientific context to represent the same type of a flux. 
However, nothing of, of this type is happening now and there is a danger that we may be ultimately left wishing for a lost organic society which may yet prove to be an El Dorado for us. Now, there are certain contradictions also. A self does not amount to much, but no self is an island in itself also. All of us exist, each of us exist in a fabric of relationships that is very complex and very mobile. In fact, more complex and more mobile than ever before in the history of mankind. All of us are located at different nodal points of specific communication circuits. However tiny we may be in our individual situation, but in this collected complex web, each of us is important. Let us say that all of us are located at a post through which various kinds of messages pass. No one, not even the least privileged amongst us is ever entirely powerless as far as the messages that traverse and position through us, you know. And therefore, the, each in, the contribution of each individual is also very important. Lutard's ideas have also been criticized by various philosophers. Prominent among them are Alex Kalinkos and Jurgen Habermas. Basically, they have based their arguments on two points. Firstly, they say that even though Lyotard has rejected the previous meta narratives of truth, of progress, of scientific reason, etcetera, but he has also used this term meta, I mean, incredulity towards meta narratives in such a way that it is to be treated as a universal skepticism. If he is so much against the universality of meta narratives, how can the skepticism of the postmodern conditions be a universal aspect in itself? So, this is a very valid and uh, very valid and a very significant objection also. Another aspect which they have used to criticize Lyotard's postmodernist condition is that he has used primarily the tools of the modernist criticism to assail them instead of using another set of new tools. However, let us say that even though Lyotard's postmodern incredulity towards meta narratives could be said to be self refuting, if one is skeptical of universal narratives such as truth, knowledge, right or wrong, then perhaps there is no basis for believing that the truth in master narratives is becoming is being undermined. So, in this sense the paradox of postmodernism is similar to the liar's paradox when a liar says this statement is false. So, the fuzziness of the postmodern condition does not become very clear to us simply if we relate to Lyotard's arguments. We can also say that in many respects Lyotard's arguments are open to meta narrative interpretation. Postmodernism is an anti theory. However, it has also used as I have commented earlier the theoretical tools of the previous ages to make its case. The significance of this contradiction however, is of course, also open to interpretation. However, I would sum up my discussion of Lyotard by saying that he has opened up new critical dimensions and approaches as far as uni universal cognition is concerned. This discussion is carried forward in an equally significant way by Foucault, who we are going to discuss now. A French literary critic, Foucault is known for his critiques of various social institutions, most notably psychiatry, medicine and the prison system and also for his theories which were collated in his volumes on the history of sexuality. His general theories concerning power and their relationship with knowledge as well as his ideas concerning discourse in relation to the history of the western thought have been widely discussed and applied. Major influences as far as Foucault's ideas are concerned have been on the feminist theories, the queer theories, the post colonial theories also. He was critical of social constructs that implied an identity from the identity of being a male or a female or a homosexual to that of criminals and political activists. Foucault's theories on identity are exemplified 
by his observation that homosexual identity has progressed over the years from an implied act to an implied identity. His idea is that whereas a couple of centuries earlier homosexuality was considered to be an act, now it has come to represent an identity within the given social spheres. His work is often described either as a postmodernist or a post-structuralist one by contemporary comments, commentators and critics. During the 1960s when he had started to publish, he was often more associated with the post-structuralist movement. Although Foucault was initially happy with this description, very soon he started to withdraw from this description, arguing that unlike the structuralist, he had not adopted a formalist approach. At the same time, he was also not very happy by his description as a postmodernist critic. He said that he is more comfortable while he is being referred to as a person who tries to define what modernity is. Foucault is primarily known for his combined idea, ideas on knowledge and power. In this connection, I would start my discussion by quoting Philip Stokes. Philip Stokes says, and I quote, the theme that underlies all Foucault's work is the relationship between power and knowledge and how the former is used to control and define the latter. What authorities claim as scientific knowledge are really just means of social control. Foucault shows how, for instance, in the 18th century, madness was used to categorize and stigmatize not just the mentally ill, but the poor, the sick, the homeless and indeed anyone whose expressions of individuality were in unwelcome. Philip Stokes has very summarily presented what exactly is the relationship between knowledge and power or power and knowledge as Foucault has tried to describe. Along with the other social theorists, Foucault had always believed that knowledge is always a form of power. However, he is different from others in the sense that he has gone a step further and told us that knowledge can be gained from power and not vice versa only. He says that knowledge can be gained from power, producing it, not preventing it. Through observation, new knowledge is also produced and gained. In his view, knowledge is forever connected to power and he also writes them in this way, power slash knowledge, so that they are combined. And it is in this context that we have to understand when this statement that knowledge is power in the connection of Foucault's theory. Later on towards the end of this slide, I have also quoted directly from Foucault and if we particularly look at the last two sentences, then this combination becomes clear to us. And I read, thus there is no power relation without the correlative constitution of a field of knowledge, nor any knowledge that does not presuppose and constitute at the same time power relations. So, in the context of Foucault, we find that this age old dictum knowledge is power gains a fresh dimension. For him, power exists everywhere and it comes from everywhere. And it was a key concept because it acts as a type of relation between people, a complex form of strategy with the ability to secretly shape another's behavior. It is also notable that Foucault did not view the effects of power in a negative fashion. For him, power is not necessarily repressive. It does not necessarily censor. It also does not necessarily conceal. Rather, it is a producer of reality. It produces domains of objects and rituals of truth. The importance for Foucault always lay in the fact that power has an entire networks, practices, the world around us and how our behavior can be affected and not absolutely power in isolation. He is also primarily known for his idea which has been termed as panopticism. This idea of panopticism is derived from an architectural design which is known as panopticon. This architectural design was finalized by Jeremy Bentham, 
Bentham the famous mid 19th century British utilitarian philosopher. Jeremy Bentham had finalized his design primarily for the prisons and insane asylums. Later on it came to be accepted for architecting, architecture in the buildings of schools, hospitals and factories. It is a per particular type of an architecture in which a single sentry can keep an eye on all the prison inmates or on all the patients in an insane asylum. He is positioned on a tower centrally located and all the rest of the cells are open so that the person even though is single or it is only a small team of two people can keep a watch on what is going on inside this big structure. In the 19th century, the modernist states wanted to create structures in such a fashion that the criminals can also be kept in isolation and gradually they may be made to be a useful participant in the social progress. They wanted to do away with the medieval tortures, the dungeons, the beheadings etc. And this idea of panopticon, this particular architectural design offered a very powerful yet sophisticated internalized coercion which was achieved through the constant observation of prisoners. In this type of a design, each prisoner or each inmate was separated from the other. They were not allowed any interaction, any communication with each other. And this structure also allowed guards to continually see inside each cell from their vantage point in a high central tower unseen by the prisoners. Constant observation acted as a control mechanism. It actually ultimately resulted amongst the prisoners and the inmates in a consciousness of constant surveillance. So, when this consciousness of constant surveillance is internalized, the behavior changes, the personality also gradually changes. So, panopticon has been used as a metaphor by Foucault here, which has allowed him to explore the relationship between systems of social control and people in a disciplinary situation as well as the power knowledge concept. In his view, power and knowledge come from observing others. It marked the transition to a disciplinary power with every movement supervised and all events recorded. The result of this surveillance is acceptance of regulations and docility, a normalization of sorts stemming from the threat of discipline. And this is exactly what Foucault means by the internalization of the consciousness of surveillance. A suitable behavior is achieved not through total surveillance, but by panoptic discipline and inducing a population to confirm by the internalization of this reality that they are under watch and surveillance. The actions of the observer are based upon this monitoring and the behaviors he sees exhibited. And Foucault says that the more one observes, the more powerful one becomes. The power comes from the knowledge the observer accumulates over a passage of time after looking at the behavior of the prisoners or the inmates over a passage of time. So, this knowledge and the power of his position reinforce each other. Foucault's ideas about the internalization of the consciousness of surveillance are very important in today's context also. We do not have the architectural structure, but let us say that the modern day surveillance technique have also generated a consciousness of surveillance among most of the people today. Foucault also echoes it when he says that the real danger was not necessarily that individuals are repressed by the social order, but they are carefully fabricated in it. The internalization of this consciousness changes and alters the behaviors and personality modes of people in a fundamental fashion. The idea ultimately is to create docile bodies who would exactly do what they are expected to do simply because they have this internal consciousness that their behavior is under constant surveillance. So, Foucault's theory of power and knowledge becomes very significant if we put it in the context of technological advancements. During the 1970s, he had argued most notably in his books Discipline and Punish 
and the first volume of the history of sexuality that these reorganizations of knowledge were intertwined with new forms of power and domination. At that time Foucault was not very well received by the academic circles. Even though he immediately shot into popularity, we find that his work did not have enough appeal to the academicians. However, he has continued and now we find that most of the dialogues of humanities and social sciences whenever they refer to power and knowledge combination are incomplete without any reference to Foucault's work. These detailed studies of Foucault are connected to a more general conception of power and of the epistemic and political positioning of the criticism of power, which many critics have found less satisfactory. Foucault's discussions of the relation between truth and power have similarly provoked concerns about their reflexive implications for his own analysis. Foucault is also critical of traditional theories of power such as the Marxist philosophy and also many of the non-Marxist theories also and he believes that they are guilty of a certain economism in their analysis of power. Foucault established his theories, his ideas about this combination of power and knowledge in his two lectures which he had delivered in 1976 at the College de France. In the first lecture he had suggested that in the juridical and liberal theories of power, power is viewed as something that can be acquired like a commodity, it can be exchanged from one person to another through a contractual act. In the second lecture, he goes on to establish that a non-economist analysis of power is somehow different from these traditional approaches towards the analysis of power. The juridical and liberal theories of power understand power as repressive, whereas Foucault states that this idea of power needs to be rethought and the mechanism of power need to be seen as facilitating something more than just repression. In his second lecture, Foucault questions how power is exercised. In order to understand the mechanism of power, Foucault establishes two limits. The first limit relates to the rules of right that formally delimit power and the second relates to the effects of truth or knowledge produced and transmitted by power and which in turn reproduce this power. So, once the issues of rights formally delimit power, we find that power and knowledge run together and it is therefore, Foucault says that we do not only have a combination of knowledge and power, rather we have a triangle of power, right and knowledge, each corner reinforcing the other two. Foucault has always been obsessed with the idea of power as well as brute force. He says that excessive force can coerce or destroy the target. However, discipline and training can reconstruct it to produce new gestures, habits, skills, actions and ultimately different and new temperaments among people. Foucault was interested in the difference between massive but infrequent exercises of destructive force like public executions, military occupations, violent suppression of insurrections and the uninterrupted constraints imposed in practices of discipline and training. For him, it was simply not a question of treating the body in mass wholesale as if it were an indissociable unity but of working it in retail individually, of exercising upon it a subtle coercion, of obtaining holds upon it at the level of the mechanism itself. By controlling the movements, gestures, attitudes, rapidity, even an infinitesimal power over the active body, we can try gradually to have a control over the body itself. So, the human body was entering a machinery of power that explores it, breaks it down and then rearranges it. It defined how one may have a hold over others bodies, not only so that they may do what one wishes, but so that they may operate as one wishes. And the difference between these two statements is very deep. With the techniques, the speed and the efficiency that one determines, thus discipline produces subjected and practiced bodies discipline produces docile bodies and this exactly 
is one of the purposes of using force in a systematic manner by the instruments of power. Similarly, schedules, programmed movements and exercises correlated with developmental stages serve to economize the time of life to accumulate it in a useful form and to exercise power over men through the mediation of time. Foucault saw these techniques of power and knowledge as undergoing a two stage development. His idea is that they were initially started as means of control in order to neutralize the dangers of antisocial elements, to organize the behavior in a suppressive manner of those people who were a threat to a civilized society. They were initially cultivated, these practices were initially cultivated within isolated institutions, most notably in prisons, in hospitals, in asylums for mentally unstable people, also in army camps and gradually they were transferred to schools and factories. So, they were gradually adapted into techniques that could be applied in various other contexts. And this idea of applying them from an isolated context to a more open and general context that has a definite appeal to Foucault. He calls this broadening of the scope of application the swarming of disciplinary mechanisms. The mechanisms have a certain tendency to become deinstitutionalized, to emerge from the closed fortress in which they once functioned and to circulate in a free state. Foucault did not see these new techniques as simply superimposed upon a pre-existing social order. His nominalism remained prominent in his studies of power knowledge as it took these politico epistemic practices to constitute new object. He also has talked about the biographical unities like delinquency, homosexuality or hyperactivity, developmental structures etcetera. Ultimately, these practices produced new kinds of human subjects, but they also produced new forms of knowledge along with new objects to know and new modalities of power. What connected the levels of epistemic analysis and political regulation was the practice of normalizing judgment and the construction of norms as a field of possible knowledge. Norms seem to have their place primarily in the knowledge of populations since they demarcate distributions. Norms are indispensable to the new knowledges of individuals. For how else was one to produce knowledge of individuals that did not simply subsume their individuality under a type? A normalization process, a normalization distribution process enables us to locate the individual within an epistemic field without reducing the individual to the typical. So, Foucault therefore discusses normalization as a technique of power and its epistemic implications also emerge clearly in his account. This process produces a whole range of degrees of normality indicating membership of a homogeneous social body, but also playing a part in classification, in the creation of hierarchy and in the distribution of rank. Foucault objects to the very idea of a knowledge or a truth outside of network of power relations. The scope of his objection thus also encompasses the possibility of a critical knowledge that would speak the truth to power, exposing domination for what it is and thereby enabling or encouraging effective resistance to it. When we talk in about Foucault's relationship between the knowledge and the power, we find that resistance is also a compulsory corollary to it. Foucault has clearly conveyed certain things, certain points as far as the relationship between power and knowledge is concerned and as far as we view power as being having certain attributes. Power is not an attribute of a single center, it is exercised in social relationships only. Secondly, power is not repressive, it is productive, it is also decentralized and multidimensional and power is intentional yet non-subjective. After having said that, Foucault further says that when only a group of people or a certain people control knowledge, oppression is a possibility. We need to find out who is recording our actions and at least then we will know who has power and who does not have the power. And therefore, Foucault says that resistance is imminent to 
power relations. However, whereas Foucault has detailed his ideas on knowledge and power, he has remained relatively silent or hesitant in systematically defining resistance. However, in his The Will to Knowledge, he says, where there is power, there is resistance and yet or rather consequently this resistance is never in a position of exteriority in relation to power. Here also his statement is not very clear. At best it tells us about a particular relative position of resistance. However, if we put this quote in the context of one of his interviews which were recorded in 1982, we perhaps would ha be able to have a better picture of Foucault meant by resistance. And I quote, if there was no resistance, there would be no power relations because it would be a matter of obedience. You have to use power relations to refer to the situations where you are not doing what you want. So, resistance comes first. Foucault's conception of power makes it possible to understand power relations as excluding, excluding the consent or willingness of the subject acted upon without therefore denying the agency of the subject. Resistance can thus be understood as analogous to the freedom. Foucault clearly says that power is not something which is possessed or wielded by powerful agents because it is co-constituted by those who support and resist it. It is not a system of domination as far as Foucault is concerned that imposes its rules upon all those it governs because any such rule is always at issues in ongoing struggles. So, in, in Foucault's dynamics of power, power is always dispersed across complicated and heterogeneous social networks which are marked by continuous struggle also. What could it mean to conceive similarly of a dynamics of knowledge? The notion may seem initially very strange because the conception of knowledge as a body of warranted true beliefs has such a strong hold upon us. As people, we find it very difficult to oppose something handed over to us as knowledge because mankind has been trained to have an ingrained belief in the stronghold of knowledge which cannot be easily challenged. So, when we sum up Foucault's contribution to postmodernist philosophy, we have to remember that it is a step ahead towards the incredulity which is always emphasized on by the postmodernist belief. If Lyotard has taught us that we should have an incredulity towards meta narratives, Foucault has also told us that power and knowledge and resistance are a compulsory part of the postmodernist condition. Thank you.